Hello, everyone. My name is Klaas, and I, would, I, and I would like to welcome you to this 45 minute webinar. Today, you will learn more about the export model. Before we start, I will quickly exp explain the interface. On your right, you will see two buttons one to participate in polls, and one to ask questions. Our expert will answer your questions at the end of the session during the Q&A. Then I would like to introduce you to, the, to today's speaker, Bram Varewijk. Bram started his career as a corporate lawyer for a large international law firm. Most of his career, he was export director at Duval, Duval Moortgat, Leonidas, and several scale-ups in Belgium and Sweden. Some interesting facts about Bram. He has lived in five countries and speaks five languages. He has visited over 70 countries. Hence, he has an active network on five continents. After moving house 18 times, he now lives in pure St. Amans with his wife and three daughters. And in his spare time, he likes to kite surf. Bram, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Klaas, for this uh, kind introduction. And welcome to you all to this uh, webinar of business markers totally focused on exports. I saw on the participants lists that we have quite some experienced exporters and also some beginning beginners from nine different countries. The good thing is that you're all realizing that internationalization is an important growth lever for your companies, but probably also that it's not easy to export. So in the next 45 minutes, it's my pleasure to take you through the key aspects of building an export plan and have a successful execution. We'll have time at the end for some questions, but for almost enjoyed the export flight. And I can assure you, you're not alone. So let me start with some specific examples. Imagine we are a producer of innovative washers, especially for glasses of wine and cocktail bars. We've been quite successful on the, uh, on the Belgian market for quite some years now, and we've invested at the end of last year in extra production equipment. We also hired four new full-time equivalents. But in March of 2020, Corona hit the country. The bars and restaurants had to close, and hence we wanted to start exporting to fill our overcapacity and to spread some of our risks. We've prospected and in September, we participated in a uh, interesting fair, um, mainly focused on the Horeca equipment business. The result from this fair was 140 different contacts from 30 different countries. But how did we go about choosing the right countries to start our export? Are we choosing the big countries? Are we taking into account the distance from our home country? Was it the friendly person that we contacted? It's not an easy choice. And don't get me wrong, fairs will remain, even digitally, a very useful prospection tool. But you must prepare well. Too often, export starts with unexpected spontaneous contacts. For example, on the fair, we meet one of the biggest bar owners in, um, in Prague, for example. And we ask our organization to quickly prepare three washers and get them ready and shipped. But our organization is not prepared for this, and it takes a lot of extra energy from them often without the long-term results that we expect. It's important to be clear, to be clear about our dream. We have our glass washers installed in the best cocktail bars around the world. That's our aim. And of course, we should focus and build our plan around this dream. We want to have our exports uh, are exported dishwashers in the best bars and cocktail bars around the world, including the Atlas Bar in Singapore. In this webinar, I will offer you a framework to structure your export activities and make choices that yield real results. The second example is the importance of trustworthy partners. Imagine this situation. You meet a strong partner from Mexico, you visited each other in 2019, both in Mexico and in Belgium. You agree on the strategy, on the portfolio, on common investments, and even uh, there's a personal match with the person there. The client uses a standard contract that he uses for all his other suppliers, 
and our company's legal counsel checked it. And after a few amendments, we signed the contract. The first order is prepared swiftly and shipped. We've gotten on to a good start. Two months later, according to plan, the second order comes in. And we allow that payment will be done upon the arrival of the goods in Mexico. That was agreed in the contract because our importer's clients only pay him in 90 days. And as partners, we agreed to split the burden on the cash flow. The second order is prepared swiftly and shipped, but as you can guess, upon arrival, no payment. We are unable to reach our contact person, not by email, telephone, and eventually through the local chamber of commerce, we had to hire a local lawyer. And we learned that the contact person who signed the contract was actually not authorized to do so. Furthermore, the clauses on the applicable law and the applicable enforceable courts are not enforceable in Mexico. The conclusion, what is worse than having no contract, it's having a bad contract with your partners. The third example treats the complexity that export brings to your organization. And this, unfortunately, is a, a true story that I learned from a warehouse of a Belgian fast-moving consumer goods company. In the warehouse, two orders are being prepared, one for Japan and one for China. But unfortunately, the goods for Japan are loaded in the Chinese container and vice versa. As a result, two months later, we have two very unhappy clients, no sellable goods and a lot of loss of sales. The export mark, uh, manager, of course, he gets presented a huge bill, not only for the wrong transports, also the import taxes on the goods, fines at the customs, demerge costs in the harbor. Furthermore, the goods cannot be transported directly from China to Japan to solve the situation. No, they have to return back to the port of origin, in this case, Antwerp. But the Japanese client wants his goods, fresh goods, as quickly as possible. So we have to arrange air freight. Of course, he also wants compensation for the delay. You can imagine a huge cost is involved with just a silly mistake. But is this the fault of the warehouse person not knowing the difference between Japanese and Chinese labels? Of course not. But there's an easy solution to treat these kind of problems. You need to organize internally to avoid such expensive mistakes. And these examples actually bring us to three common pitfalls on export. First of all, people jumped very quickly on ad hoc opportunistic export opportunities. Secondly, we have insufficient knowledge of the markets and the partners we work with. And thirdly, poor organization can really be detrimental for an effective implementation internally and on the markets. To solve these three complex situations in a structured manner, I built an export model. Right, let's launch a rocket together. This export model actually consists of four parts. The first one is to make clear why we are exporting. What are our export ambitions? Secondly, we have to build a launch platform for our rockets. What will we export? Where to? Who will sell our goods? And how will we organize ourselves? The third block is the rocket itself. If once we know where we're going, we can build an appropriate rocket for that particular market. Finally, we must prepare the landing of our rockets. Make sure we land on the right stars, we monitor our presence and adapt our plans accordingly. We also want to learn, not for just for this market, but possibly for other markets we want to conquer. In the remaining 35 minutes, uh, I won't be able to discuss every single block of this model. I will focus on the more, most important ones. But please know that behind each of these blocks, there are a lot of theories, checklists, exercises we can do, examples and some templates that we actually have. And you can pose your specific questions, of course, at the end of this webinar, but also contact us directly later on if you want to organize some separate sessions on a uh, specific subject. Right, this is the model, let's jump in. The first step, what are our export ambitions? Why are we exporting? Of course, we all want to generate more turnover and more profit to invest in the future of our company. Maybe you have an overcapacity in production that you want to solve, or you want to spread your risks among many more countries. 
or you get a lot of spontaneous requests from uh, potential clients and you're not quite sure which ones to choose. Maybe you want to test a new product in a market, but not in your big home market. So you want to find a test market to do this. Finally, it could also be the ego of your CEO who might uh, actually want to export because he enjoys drinking cocktails in Singapore's bars. Once we have defined our export goals, it's important to know uh, and quantify them. How you quantify them? Maybe you want to determine that your export should be a certain percentage of your total turnover. Maybe you want to count the number of pieces or containers or the number of users that you have uh, engaged uh, abroad. Maybe you want to have 20 clients in 20 countries on five continents, uh, five continents in the next three years, for example. It could also be that you want to pimp your company's image in the press and maybe gain a prize. It's important to check your gut feeling and compare it with the market analysis to make sure your ambitions are realistic. Of course, the results will really depend on the resources you invest and, of course, the engagement of the top management of your company. And how do you want to go about realizing these ambitions? By trial and error, for example? Well, yes, of course, you have to try, make mistakes and learn. Or better, hang a little bit further and I'll bring you through some common mistakes I've seen throughout my career. But of course, it's not only trial and error. You need to plan because a strong plan can avoid expensive errors that we've seen before. With a good plan, you can avoid mistakes and achieve results faster. And talking of plans, I assume, well, I hope all of you have a strategic business plan for your company for the next three to five years. But a question, who has a specific export plan? A specific export plan next to the general business plan. I will check into the poll and please submit your votes. Do you have a specific export plan for your company? Yes or no? It's about 50-50. A bit more to the yeses. Still 50-50. Looks a bit like the um, American elections. OK, we have a slight majority for people who don't have an export plan, which of course, it's not a problem. We will help you how to build one. And for those of you who do have a plan, it's important uh, to check maybe that you've uh, not forgotten things or maybe you want to clarify if you have certain aspects. Because talking about plans, it's important. But if you don't know where you are going, you'll probably end up somewhere else. In many companies, as I said, export grows opportunistic. And sometimes that turns out well, but often, you underestimate the complexity of all the departments that export involves. It's your purchase department, your production, your warehouse, your sales and marketing, uh, your accounting, legal, logistics, and even your management time that you spend on it. And often, therefore, the return on investment of export is overestimated because there are a lot of hidden costs that are not taken into account. And therefore, most important tip of today, export should be a conscious strategic choice and get your engagement from top management to get the necessary resources and focus. Experienced exporters will professionalize. They want to build their export team and coach them, make more detailed sales and marketing plans for their core markets and make sure they implement them more successfully. Starting exporters probably have a choice now to start in a more structured way. You must know where you're going to get organized. And that brings us to the next part of our model, building the rocket launch base platform. What will we export? To which country? To who shall we sell this? And how will we organize ourselves to achieve these goals? I'll give a lot of attention to this part of the model because it's important to have a very strong foundation to launch your first rocket, but also possible more rockets afterwards. First of all, we need to look inside the belly of our organization. What aspects are we really strong at and how can we value them? For example, we have a strong export team because our export manager, he lived in Japan for 10 years, speaks Japanese fluently, and also he speaks Dutch, French, English, and German. Fantastic uh, capabilities. But what if we actually realize that 
the most potential markets for our products or services is Latin America. Then these languages are not very helpful. So we need to adapt. Another example can be a Flemish uh, producer of uh, big carpets. And we are selling to the Ritz Hotel in Paris for the suites. Well, that's a great international reference, uh, reference uh, that we can use um, in our worldwide marketing. Of course, we will also notify um, our analysis and see that we have some limitations that we need to solve. For example, the communication with our clients currently works through email and telephone, and sometimes we even receive some faxes. The export team, unfortunately, in Belgium exists of only one person who works nine to five. We see that the order intake has a lot of manual work and we can have some human error involved. Furthermore, it's not really a big, good customer experience. Our conclusion, or we can hire more people and have a night shift, or to be really efficient on export, we will have to invest in an online order portal to service our clients better. After the internal analysis, we also need to look outside into the market to look around us in which market are we operating are there are other rockets flying around and what do they look like who made them where are they coming from and where are they going to maybe we can connect with them or we might collide of course you get the gist that we're making a special export swat not just a regular SWOT. We want to score our strengths and weaknesses, trends and threads, um, to make sure which are our important aspects that we need to take into account when exporting. Apart from scoring, we also want to add some implications of how we can use or uh, mitigate some of these aspects and have the necessary actions connected to them. I gave you some examples for strengths and weaknesses, but also there are some opportunities or trends. For example, we are a producer of fancy gentleman shoes, and we find out that actually men are also buying shoes more and more online. That offers potential for a web shop. But of course, we need to decide how we will uh, be different than our big competitor Zalando, for example. An example of a threat, we are an IT company who uh, developed an, a very interesting app that's very popular in Brazil. But of course, there is the risk of the volatility of the Brazilian real compared to the euro. This first block of the launch platform, the inside outside analysis um, is very important. And you can count on a lot of free information sources, Flanders Investment and Trade in Belgium, but also the local offices, the local Belgian Chamber of Commerce, for example, uh, the VOCA, uh, VLIO, or some sector organizations in your sector. Uh, your banks uh, often have nice databases and market reports. Uh, use your network as well, of course. Another tip, when you do this exercise, don't do it alone. Do it with an internal multidisciplinary team. Involve your other colleagues from different departments and some experienced specialists. It'll give you a much wider view of your plans and possibilities and hurdles, and you'll end up with a much stronger plan. When we go to the second block of our launch platform, that's the country selection. Where will we export to? As I said, often this happens very unexpectedly and we don't really know much about the country that people con uh, contact us from. So what countries or markets will we select and how will we uh, tackle these country specific challenges? Well, of course, it's important first of all that you take control. You, to, you choose the market where you want to export to and don't let the market choose you. An example, when you go to the fair, like we mentioned before, make sure you do your homework and find out to which markets you are most interested in and arrange contacts with those players from those markets that you want to target. And if you have, to, if you have contacts, and probably you will, with other people from other markets, that's fine. They can be a nice extra, but don't let them distract you and your organization from your main goal. To select a country, there are actually four crucial components. First of all, there's the general market studies. Um, based on that, you'll do a pre-selection of your priority countries. For those, you will make a detailed market analysis, determine the size of the market, and how you will enter the market. The first component is the market study. I mentioned you can do some desk research using some free information sources. 
like chambers of commerce, sector organizations, banks, and so forth. But also field research is possible, even digitally from behind your desk. You can use your LinkedIn, you can look into local bloggers to see what's cooking in a certain market. A tip, it's very important to compare the markets, their sizes, the segments, the trends and limitations they might have, and how strong the competition is in each of these markets. The second tip is to exclude certain markets very early if you realize they will have a big impact on your current internal organization and possibly your home markets. Based on this selection, you will have a pre-selection of a short list of about two to three priority markets on which you will focus with the second component. And that's a detailed market analysis. There are, of course, a lot of examples of models that you can use to um, get a better picture of your market. D-Step or the PEST is one of them. And on the internet, you can find actually some a lot of international uh, data that compares uh, various countries. So you can help score the priorities. But be sure to also take into account logistics from the start. For example, if you're an IT company and you're launching certain software uh, on a global release date, make sure that you take into account the time differences and make sure your help desk is available at all times. When you're transporting goods, make sure that you take into account that sh shipping some goods to France can be done by the next day. But if you have the launch in the same time in Japan, you need to send your products two months earlier, at least. A second example of logistical uh, challenges is the infrastructure. Not all countries have the same developed logistics infrastructure. You can send a cool container, a reefer container to India, but from experience, I've realized that the local infrastructure in the ports, for example, or the trucks that are being used, or the, or the, the warehouse of your importer is not always in line with, you, uh, with what you know. It's important to go and check. A third example of logistics is to take into account climate differences, seasons. When you're exporting goods to Canada, for example, it's important to take into account shipments during the winter time or the summer time. Will you choose from the land route or the sea route to Vancouver? The third component to analyze our market is the market size. You want to calculate how big your market is. How much sales can you do in euros or in pieces or in, in number of users? Uh, how many can you do per country or per, for a certain region that you want to focus on or per market segments? There are two ways to calculate the market size. There's a top-down and a bottom-up way. For example, of a top-down calculation. If we imagine that 1% of the 1.4 billion Chinese people will drink just one duvel every day or every month to be safe. If that's so, we can sell at least 55 million liters of duvel per year in China. That means that duvel market will have to build a few new uh, breweries. But let's do a check first from bottom up. For example, if we start our investments with two full-time equivalents in Shanghai, each with an electrical bike, and they carry around some sample boxes of beer to about 10 horeca accounts or shops per day, we give them a success ratio of 20%, that means that they will sell one case per week in each of these clients. That adds up to 2,500 liters of beer, which is about half a container in the first year. So there's a big difference between half the container and 55 million liters per year. When you have these realistic expectations, it's important to decide now how you will enter the market. And this is a strategic decision that will be important for the rockets that we will build. You have three options, pure trading, pure export sales. It can be direct from you in Belgium to a partner abroad, or you can do it indirectly. For example, when you are a Belgian company who makes industrial uh, cutting machines for uh, meat products, for example, and you don't want to export directly yourself, you can work together with a big Belgian uh, producer of, um, of machines that are used in slaughterhouses, for example. And you can use their export organization. The second strategic option is collaborating. You can work with partners, importers, agents, or set up a franchise network. But be aware, there are a lot of different national regulations regarding uh, the practical and, and uh, legal aspects of each of these partnerships. That would take us too far today. 
A third option is creating yourself, creating your own organization by setting up a joint venture or even a 100% subsidiary. You can have your sales office or even a local production. It's important to have a trade-off between the commitment that you expect um, and you want to take and the investments you do, and of course, the control and the risks that you will take. Right, so after the country selection, we need to select which products or services we want to sell. We can look at it from the inside out. Which existing products and services do we have and we are ready to scale and sell abroad? We also need to look from the outside in. How does the target market look like? Should we test the market first with certain products? Should we amend our products, modify them, produce them locally, or maybe package them differently? Let's use the example of luxurious gentleman's shoes made from calf's leather, bought in Switzerland, made in Belgium, and sold successfully in Belgium and the UK, for example. We receive an, uh, a question from a candidate importer from Dubai. But when we do our market analysis, we realize that in Dubai, people use moccasins, shoes without shoelaces. We need to pose ourselves the question, are we prepared to change our production and make shoes without shoelaces? That brings us to the value proposition. We need to know who is our target audience? Who will we sell our products to, segment our markets? For example, for the shoe example, gentlemen luxuries shoes will be sold to gentlemen who go to work in a suit. Of course, we need to specify this later on, but this is a general uh, time to determine your market segmentation and your marketing mix and USPs compared to the competition. Later on, when, we've discerned, when we are building our rockets for the specific market, we need to specify and fine tune, of course, these examples. The next block is to measure success. We need to set ourselves some smart goals in terms of quantity, but also the quantity that we want to ensure. We need to take into account the timing of our return on investments. We also want to ensure uh, our internal success, which means, is our team motivated? How will we measure the cooperation between the various departments? How will we report internally? But also externally, we need to get feedback from our clients using the net promoter score, for example, we can test this. We need to look into the reactions from our competitors on the markets. How many times are, uh, are we getting some press coverage? Or maybe we are getting more spontaneous requests from certain countries. These are all the ways in which we can measure our export success. All right, little by little, our plan is making is taking some shape. But of course, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. What if risks? We need to be quite early in determining which risks that we want to take and which ones we don't want to take. Which are the potential risks are there and how can we mitigate them? I think the best way to make this clear is to use some specific examples. For example, our risk is that the results are uh, slower than we expected and we're actually spending more cost on exports than we anticipated. This is often because there is a lack of preparation. And this is not just by smaller companies. Also, large companies sometimes forget to take cultural differences into account. In 1985, for example, IKEA invested $2 million to open their first store in the US, in Philadelphia. But when they launched it, they had to realize the hard way that the standard sizes of the beds in the US is different than the standard size in Europe. So most of the utensils regarding the, the, the beds were unsellable. An example of a political risk, for example, is a Belgian producer of pears, and he exports 85% of his pears to Russia. But then he gets hit by a Russian political embargo on European fruits. Of course, he can buy some insurance for this, but that'll be very expensive. An alternative would be to look at some alternative markets to which he can sell and spread his risks. Also commercially, there are some risks involved that you need to mitigate. Let me take an example. How do you want to put your, market, your brand in the market? I'll use an example that I uh, experienced myself visiting a Romanian importer in Bucharest. 
And he was really proud of a promotion he developed uh, himself with a very artistic looking poster inspired on the one that you see on the screen right now. To be honest, it looked a bit more like naked women with some very nice forms in the form of a duvel glass. Of course, I, I, I appreciate a little bit of uh, local creativity and interpretation of our brand guidelines, but to make things worse, he posted most of these posters in the toilets of the bars and restaurants in, in Bucharest. That's not really the image we wanted for our brand, being this champagne of the beers. So how can we mitigate this? Make sure you have your brand guidelines ready. Train the people, the local teams, and check if they're telling the right story about your product, your service, or your brand on the market. And check up and visit the markets, of course. The next example is a logistical one. I've seen a lot of logistical mistakes uh, happening, and that's something, like I said, that you need to take a lot of attention to. Not only wrong deliveries, like the one with China and Japan, but also the quality of the transportation is, is important. For example, I visited a Leonidas chocolate store in the Canary Islands, and the black chocolates had a, a fat blooming, a white cover, a white um, uh, look on them. That often happens through temperature changes. I checked the temperature in the store, and that was fine. And also in the warehouse, the temperature was good, and the best before dates on the boxes was fine. But talking to the client, I realized that his sales weren't doing as well as he, as he hoped. And actually, when I poked a bit further, he had um, taken into uh, the cheaper route to market. He had used a cheaper transportation without the necessary cooling installations. That was one of the dangers that you have when you have an ex-works agreement with your client, when he is uh, taking care of the transport by himself. But there are solutions, of course. First of all, a good contract with the right income terms is important. Uh, but it's also important to be clear on who will take the end responsibility to the, for the quality of the transportation up until the end consumer. You have to be very strong with the selection of your partners to make sure they can do this. And of course, you need to check, you track and trace. You can put loggers in your boxes or in your containers or in your lorries uh, to measure the temperature and the humidity throughout the whole route and then you can act accordingly. Make also sure to have some feet on the streets. Go and visit your market or send some mystery shoppers to do that for you. There are also financial risks, of course. Exchange rates being one of them. Like I said, when you're buying your calf's leather from a farmer in Switzerland, in Swiss francs, francs and you're selling it in euros to a client in Japan who needs to exchange his Japanese yen into euros, there's a lot of margin pressure in various partners in the supply chain. One tip is, of course, hedging for the exchange rates, but that might be expensive. But in some bigger markets, it might be important for you to set up a local organization. That way, you will not only have your income, but also your costs in the same uh, exchange rate, in the same currency. The second point in the financial risks is the cash drain from investing in export. Of course, you need to invest first before you can deal the results. And to help you in Belgium, for Belgian companies, uh, you can take into account the Vlajo growth subsidy, up to 50,000 euros. If you show that internationalization is a strategic pillar in the future of your company, and if you invest yourself in either a strategic collaborator or external expert advice. Make sure to check out the site. Other risks are legal. We already talked about a strong contract, but it's also important to make sure your company brand name and your image is protected. Intellectual property is important. I had a client who, out of ease, um, had the local trademark registrations done by his importer to avoid all the administrative uh, work involved. But two years later, uh, he was no longer happy with his importer and wanted to change. They did not have a contract in which uh, the brands and trademarks were discussed, and it was actually on the importer's name, and he did not want to give it away for free. It's very important to keep control of your own brands and use license agreements. I myself actually uh, asked for a patent uh, in the maritime sector when we made a uh, uh, innovative um, 
piece of plastic to protect the ship uh, when it goes in, enters the harbor. It's a very complex procedure and make sure you have some local specialists um, guide you with this. And it's also very expensive, not only with the application, but also with the, uh, the annual continuation of your protection. This is per country. So make sure you choose your countries wisely and don't start in 80 countries and pay all the thousands of euros of protection for each of these countries. So make your choices. The next risk is about internal complexity and possible resistance in, within your uh, colleagues. We talked about the mistakes that can be made uh, and the very expensive bills that follow. This can be avoided by digitalizing rather than having special um, zones in your warehouse with the black and a, and a red sticker, for example, for one or the other countries. Digitalization avoids mistakes. It's also important to have three-way feedback. Make sure you discuss the way of working, not only internally with all the people involved uh, within your organization, but also with the client and market. And make sure you exchange these informations so that everybody can take into account each other's concerns. The last risk, of course, is unfortunately a, a very actual one, the coronavirus. I'm sure that well, most of our most of us did not take uh, a, a pandemic of this size into their strategic growth plans last year. But nevertheless, export might actually be a solution. Spreading your activities geographically means you're also spreading your risks. Because if you have a lockdown, it might not be in all the countries that you're doing business with, or not in the same period, or not with the same intensity. So that way, you can ensure at least some of your business to be continued. Secondly, Flanders Investment and Trade have actually granted additional subsidies for starting and experienced exporters. They've actually prolonged it for a few, uh, few weeks later. So make sure you check out the website, not for this support during the COVID, but also for other specific interventions. The final block of our launch pad is the financial analysis. Make sure your home business is stable, that you generate enough cash flow to invest in export. Make sure you also take into account the potential revenues and costs of your exports. And check how you will finance your international expansion. Will it be your own uh, risk capital that you will use, or will you use partners? And will you take, make use of subsidies? So our launch platform has been built. We've done our preparation. Now we're ready to do a specific launch of a rocket. We've determined one specific market. We've made some choices. And now we can focus. So for the next couple of minutes, take into account one specific market that you think of exporting to. Let's take the example again of these luxurious um, gentleman shoes made in Belgium. We want to make a specific sales plan for sending these to the UK. From a market entry point of view, we've decided to work directly with an importer uh, in Manchester and London. For London, we will use the lorry transportation. And for the Manchester importer, we've actually made a good deal with the VLM cargo plane from Antwerp to Manchester twice a week. Our distribution channels are mainly B2B, but nationally, we also want to sell our shoes online through our own webshop. But from a logistics point of view, we've organized ourselves that they can be delivered by our distributors from London and Manchester, who will get a fee, of course, by every pair of shoes they've sold. We also decided to invest in uh, sales reps, two sales reps, one in London and one in the Manchester area. They will get a fixed fee uh, and a commission on the sale, the sale of the sales. And we've decided to co-finance this with our distributors. We've given them all an exclusivity contract of one year. Of course, we need to further fine tune the sales plan with some national price setting, um, make sure each of our uh, distributors and sales reps have specific goals of how many pairs of shoes they want to sell each quarter. It's important when you're making these sales plans to involve your local teams and your partners. Then you will again have a much stronger plan and the expectations are managed. The second part of our rocket is the marketing. Just like in sales, we need to make a marketing plan specific for the country and target. Who is our target audience? Who will buy our product? Why will, are they buying it? When are they buying it? Where are they buying it? How are they using it? Are they the end users, the consumers? Or are they just intermediaries, resellers? 
for each of these, we need to take into account a specific value proposition. How are we a better partner than our competitors? You need to work out the whole marketing mix. For example, for the UK gentleman shoes example, um, we've decided to have a separate collection of shoes only for our rep shop, not to interfere with our partner's own stores. Again, it needs to be a coherent marketing strategy from a global point of view. You want your brand to be the same experienced in the whole world, but also uh, country specific. Don't just copy paste what you do in Belgium or in your home market to the same marketing campaigns abroad. Make sure you work together with HQ to get some consistency, but also work with the local partners to make sure the implementation will have the desired results. It's also important to take into account some local advice of specialists. For example, when you think about your digital strategy, which social media channels should you invest in in that market? You see from this map that the social media channels are quite different uh, in terms of popularity in various countries around the world. It's very relevant to take these cultural differences and the possible licenses that you need to get into account in advance. The next step in our rocket is our digital systems. And Again, go for a zero mistake approach. Make sure that you can do as much as possible through an online system that is connected to your ERP system your orders, your payments, uh, possible complaints, but also your sales forecasts into your production planning. Avoid communication misunderstandings, avoid human input mistakes, and avoid the time differences, for example. The next block is a logistics block. And I've already given a few examples regarding to this, so I won't go any deeper into this. Just make sure that you arrange a safe, qualitative and efficient storage and transportation of your goods up until the end consumer. The next block is the legal block. And I've already talked about intellectual property rights and bad contracts, but it's also important to check if you need any specific permits to export or your partners or yourself to import the products in a certain market. If you need to register your, you as a company or your people or your products or services, how will you tackle GDPR, for example? One more thing about contracts that I often get uh, questions about is exclusivity. It's a big risk to have a bad country uh, contract, but it's even worse to have no contract because people think without a contract, there is no rights or obligations from our partners. I can stop whenever I want to. And in some countries say, okay, we started our export activities without any strategic focus and we uh, applied uh, uh, some importers and um, started working together with them in Brazil and Spain and so forth. But as you professionalize your export activities, you realize with a better market analysis that there's much more potential in your market. But unfortunately that your initial importer is not the right partner to build your brand further. Maybe he has limited financial cap capabilities a limited team or a conflicting portfolio in some aspects. Or maybe he cannot be able to build the right partnerships due to his size, or he has not the right geographic um, reach. If you don't have a contract, nevertheless, if you've worked with, him, with this person exclusively for quite some time, de facto, he will have some rights as an exclusive importer. So you need to take into account long termination times or big termination fees, especially when you're a very important supplier to this partner. But of course, I have some experience with um, how you can change this. Initial importers will not want to sign new contracts with new, um, uh, with new obligations because they will know what's coming. But of course, there are a lot of tips that I can give you how you can treat uh, the termination of such a real um, situation and how you can arrange a win-win-win situation for you the old, the former uh, importer and a possible new importer. With the new importer, of course, it's important to have a good contract. And if you give them exclusivity, make sure you limit it or in the number of SKUs from your portfolio or maybe geographically or to, through distribution channels, limit it in time and put some volume targets behind it. Recently, I screened a letter of intent uh, for a big Belgian client and uh, I wrote a contract uh, for them for some African clients and coach the team with the negotiations for these contracts. 
So we do have some templates, some own best practices, and of course, some contacts with some specific specialists on these matters. The next block is financial. Please make sure you give enough attention to make a specific country PL. Take into account your pricing model, your cost plus, cost plus uh, calculations, but also your market value approach. If you're having sales and marketing budgets, try and get them co-financed with your partners. And make sure you get dependable information sources about the local economy. A final block in your rocket is HR, the people that you will use. Both for your export team in Belgium or your local sales teams, make sure you take into account which kind of com competences they need. Apart from language skills, of course, there will be many other things. What are their needs, both here in Belgium and abroad, when they're traveling or living in another country? And make sure that you amend your recruitment, your training and your coaching to these needs. It's also important to have some um, cooperation processes involved. Make sure they know how to work together, both internally and externally. And of course, you need to determine their salaries and how they will be paid. It's important, especially when you are uh, working with expats or subsidiary companies to engage local specialists. And for Belgium, Germany is often a very common starting market. It's very close, it's sizable, and the culture is not that different. Nevertheless, it's important to be prepared very well. And luckily, my colleagues and I, uh, my colleagues from Business Markets Germany and München Gladbach, uh, are or know a lot of specialists in each of the matters that we've discussed today. So if you want some help for Germany, feel free to reach out to us. Right, so we're coming to the last part of our export model. We've built our racket, it, locket is launched, and now it's important to prepare the landing and to make sure that we follow it up on the market itself. With this, an important lesson is be fixed on your vision, but be flexible on your journey. Between the stars, uh, you will see a lot of pitfalls that you need to judge. Of course, you need to plan in advance, you need to take a leap of faith and launch, and then learn along the way. It's important to modify and your activities as you go along. Hence, you need to fix the rocket while you're flying. There's no way back. Some of the common pitfalls that we see is that there's no strategy, a lack of plan and focus, and hence, not the desired results. Sometimes you see a lack of team or lack of teamwork uh, or not enough management engagement to make sure that everybody is behind this export project. Sometimes we see there's insufficient markets feeling and you really don't know what's happening on the market, so you cannot work proactively. We also see analysis paralysis, which means that people are analyzing and overanalyzing and not doing anything. Sometimes it's a lack of resources or just a lack of perseverance and patience to export. And often people get low, uh, expert advice when it's too late. So a lot of faults and costs can be avoided if you get help early on in your exercise. Let me end up with some tips. In the team coaching, for example, it's important to co-create your export plan as one team with your own internal colleagues and with your partners abroad. You will co-create this export plan to make it stronger and to make sure that everybody's motivated to take on its prospect, his own responsibilities. Second point is to visit markets together. Once you're allowed to travel again, make sure that you go and visit the market and learn from each other and do some on the job coaching. Make sure you get come back with internal feedback to HQ so that your production, your warehouse people, your marketing, your legal people, your uh, accounting people know what's happening in the export markets so they can help you uh, when necessary. And also make sure you use some internal PR, especially with the top management to ensure the budgets that you need to work. It's also important to take into account your network and get some expert training and coaching to make sure your export team um, builds their competences and they maintain discipline in implementing the plans. From a management, point, management reporting point of view, it's important to find to make a clear plan in advance with specific KPIs and a dashboard to follow up. Everybody should be knowing what they have to do and need to know what the others are doing. Also make sure to get some reporting procedures in place 
contact strategy with your clients, but also internally. A good CRM system is important there. Make sure you digitalize this and not only analyze the results, but also do something with them. Quality control, and think of your uh, chocolates in Tenerife, for example. Make sure you have a frontline obsession. This means that you need to go and check in the market that the end consumer is getting your products or services in the best possible way. For, first of all, you need to manage and train your partners to make sure uh, they can handle your products and services the way you want them to. And once it's done, it's important to plan and track and trace what you're doing along the way. Yeah, for example, put loggers in the containers or in your shipments. It's no excuse to say, oh, once it's out of my, uh, out of my warehouse, it's no longer my problem. No. It's always in your control, and you have the obligation to make sure that every step of the supply chain is controlled from a quality point of view. And hence, make sure you get the right partners to do so. This brings us to the partner selection and the contract management, which we talked about. It's important to screen your partners and check their references. And for the contracts, we work with specialists for the drafting of the contracts, the, the negotiations, and to get some local confirmations about certain clauses. The final tip is about prospection. Once you're in the market or people lose focus because they see opportunities everywhere and they're, they lose focus with the plan or they're fixed too much on the plan and don't really see what's cooking on the market itself. So make sure you get some feet on the streets. That's where you really learn what's happening with your clients and what the competitors are doing. Collect this information and marketing opportunities in CRM, as I said, and make sure you share them internationally with your other colleagues. Think big and wide but make sure you choose priorities and focus on their execution. Well, when you do all these things in a good way, of course, you will come to the three success factors that we started out with. Make sure you start with a conscious focus on export. Make sure you get top management engagement and invest, make choices in certain specific countries. Make a plan for these, invest in your team, invest in coaching and invest in experts. The second success factor is know your partners and your markets. Screen them thoroughly, make good contracts, and engage them for a very proactive collaboration. And the third and final success factor is one of my favorites, the frontline obsession. Internally, go for a zero mistake approach. We've seen with the, with the Japanese and Chinese example how expensive this could be. And externally, get, your, get those feet on the street. If you can't travel yourself, use mystery shoppers or contacts, but make sure you get quick feedback from the market. As a general conclusion, export. Don't be scared, you can do it. For sure you can do it. But the best tip is not to do it alone. Make sure you involve your colleagues from all different departments. Go for teamwork with your colleagues and your external partners, and of course, some specific advisors. This brings us to the end of the webinar. We thank you for your attention and please, we'll send you a uh, follow-up mail where you can actually do a self-assessment with a small online survey. And if you want, you can fill it out and we will send you some more specific tips and tricks depending on your export maturity. Right, I think this uh, leaves us some time for some questions and you can have those in the chat. I have a question from Thomas Radil from the Czech Republic. How many times in your career did opportunistic sales in a particular country convert it in strategic, partnership, uh, strategic partnerships? Well, Thomas, uh, to be honest, um, in the beginning, without having a real big strategic plan, we tried various different opportunistic contacts. And some of them never materialized to anything significant. But there was one big example, actually, in, in Israel where two owners of, uh, of a bar in Tel Aviv came to visit us in Belgium uh, at Duvel. And as they were just one bar, my, uh, my manager told me not to focus on these guys because they were not the right kind of profile uh, as, a, as a big importer that we wanted for a long-term relationship. Nevertheless, we continued in other focus markets, but I maintained some, uh, some contacts with these, with these guys. And little by little, they were buying more bars and restaurants, and they started importing some other products as well. So we started working with them uh, and, and shipping a few uh, pallets of, uh, of beer. 
And after a while, they actually became a very strong distributor, uh, selling their own bars and restaurants and focusing on the distribution in the country, both in the horeca and in the retail. And actually, it became one of our top 10 markets. And after, I think it was seven years, we were doing more than 1 million euro of turnover in Israel with these, uh, with these partners. And they sold their company actually to one of the biggest distributors of liquor and wine in Israel. So this is an example of a success story, how perseverance and gut feeling is also important. But as I said before, it's always important to back up that gut feeling with some market analysis. Let's see if we have any other questions here. I see Francis has a question. Should I go for one exclusive local partner or different partners in one country? Well, from experience, most partners will ask for exclusivity for all of your products for the whole country. There are some reasons to accept this. Uh, for example, to motivate your partner to co-invest in your brand. He will not want to invest money if somebody else is also uh, picking the fruit from this investment. It's also a way to ensure a uniform price setting and brand image on the market. On the other hand, you have to make sure that this partner is the best partner for your whole portfolio. You might want to give some brands to one partner and other brands to another. Or maybe you want to split up the market and distribution channels. One partner is very uh, strong in one part of the, of the market channels and the other in the others. Or maybe geographically, uh, it's also a way to split up the markets. So don't go too quickly by giving exclusivity. And if you do so, make sure you apply some con uh, conditions to them. Time, um, SKUs, region, uh, or minimum volume targets, for example. Any further questions? Alison has a question. During my contract negotiation for the candidate partner, um, the applicable law clause was a problem. How can I tackle this? The applicable, yeah, the, the clauses around um, the law and the applicable courts uh, in international distribution contracts is, is often a clause that's very tough to, to negotiate. And you have to try and, of course, use your bargaining power if you can, your negotiation skills, um, to see uh, that you choose a, a, a legislation and courts that you are comfortable with. And you can try and say it's your common comedy policy with all of your international partners to use Belgian law and Belgian courts. Um, but often that will not, not be uh, sufficient. You need to find some uh, some common ground. And often arbitration is a solution there. You can still look for some neutral locations like Switzerland, but that's often quite expensive. Um, but Paris or, or Lisbon um, have some very good um, uh, arbitration uh, systems. And they are not too far away from the Belgian laws that we know. And you can use English, of course, as a neutral language. Um, but make sure that you do check these clauses with your local specialists, because not all of these uh, clauses will be enforceable under local law. Any further questions? No. Let me see. Yes. One more question from Rudolf. I used to travel the world myself and knew all the markets really well and the partners. But now with my team of region managers and the corona, I can hardly visit the markets. Um, and talk to my consumers and partners. I'm responsible for global export, but it's difficult to make a budget. Well, Rudolf, there's actually um, a problem that I encountered as well as, as we grew the teams um, and you no longer have direct uh, market visits as often as you used to, and you feel, uh, you're feeling the touch uh, with, with the market less than before. It's important to make a, a common plan with, your, with you and your team, um, both here in Belgium, but also with your local teams and make sure everybody knows what they're doing and you have some good reporting feedback as well. Um, of course, if you can, and once you're allowed, make sure you try and visit the markets at least once per year, especially the core markets. Uh, so you can go and, 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 and get a finger on the pulse and coach your local people. It's also important to, to cascade your export plan, to make some individual plans so you can really follow up on it more closely and make a bottom-up budgeting, for example. Um, and if you can't travel, try and use your network uh, using LinkedIn or maybe your students, uh, alumni, uh, or the Flanders Investment and Trade uh, organizations locally. They can help you do some local market checks if you, if you want. 
Okay, well, I see no further questions, which uh, brings us to the, uh, the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, and of course, if you have any specific questions that we can help you with, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.